evening. Uh, so for the programme this evening, we will hear from three composers, Cameron Biles Vigil, sorry if I pronounced that wrong, Katarina Wallace and Raymonda Jukeita. And the theme for tonight's forum is controlling time, anticipation and suspense. We have a selection of pieces that all deal with this concept in different ways, and it'll be interesting to hear the composer's thoughts after they have introduced themselves and their work. We encourage you to ask questions, make use of the chat function, or raise the hand button, uh, which is, I think, on the bottom toolbar, to make the, this experience as interactive as possible. Please ensure you have your, your mic turned off during the performance of people's compositions as it causes a bit of disturbance. So um, without any further delay, let's move over to Cameron and his piece, Fading Time. Great, thank you for that introduction. Um, so um, also you did really well with my name. It always trips people up. It's not a nice name. The sec first half is fine. It's just the rest of it that people always go, oh. so <laughs> it's fine, don't worry. Um, so for a bit of an introduction to myself, I am Cameron Biles Vidal. I'm a Welsh composer and pianist studying for a PhD at the University of Manchester. Um, obviously from the title today that my main focus is in the time dimension of music, that's kind of my research area, but it's not just purely based upon that. My um, inspiration comes from a wide range of sources that often include nature and then also kind of the more theoretical concepts surrounding um, aspects of time and kind of the perception of time. Um, my music is primarily instrumental based. Um, and I've written for a variety of ensembles that include uh, Zaffa, Olivia, the harpist Olivia Jagers, uh, the GBSR duo, and most recently the BBC National Orchestra of Wales and the Solemn Quartet. And as I've mentioned, I do have an interest in time. And this kind of, as soon as you mention time, certain composers jump out and it's kind of the most obvious people that um, which spring to mind. So people like Elliot Carter, for example, maybe a bit of Liberty, Harrison Burtwistle. I mean, we're all composers here, so we probably immediately thought of them. But for me, my music doesn't really lean into the Elliot Carter tradition too much stylistically. Um, it used to during my master's, but it's kind of grown out of that now and I've kind of ditched that style. And it kind of exp explores the idea of pieces expanding on contracting organically over time and focusing on timbral colour and melodic lines. So some composers that particularly influenced me, for example, are the likes of Julian Anderson, Helen Grime and Sariajo. Um, to briefly talk about elements of, or kind of my own opinions on time, um, apologies, Uni of Manchester people that went to the forum where I discussed this, it's gonna be slightly similar, but also very different. Um, so please bear with me. <laughs> So um, my music often explores the polar opposites of time. Um, and currently I'm exploring more the slower static side to my music. And it kind of allows me to explore elements of memory, pacing, and kind of non-linear progression through my pieces. And also it's allowed me to kind of explore concepts of slowly controlling development rather than having kind of quick shifting blocks of texture, which normally my fast music is. Um, and there are a lot of ways that one can create stasis or motion. Like, for example, if you think of the minimalists, like you, you always get you always get a setup of rhythmic groove, for example, and then it kind of plods along very nicely. But it's kind of questions of is that actually static or is it in motion? Because on first glance, it is. You you think it's moving rather quickly and it's perceived as kind of moving, but the, as it's repetition and constant repeating the brain kind of gets acquainted with the idea and thus kind of falls into my opinion kind of static music so that's a prime example of how music sits in the middle really most music sits in the middle and i tend to have the opinion of music cannot be static purely static nor can it be purely in motion it's the only art form that begins and ends and that's terminal even if you have an installation type business thing where it's like a sign tone of the most extreme variety, it's like drone music, for example, 
and yeah, it's not moving, but the psychoacoustics of the way that happened in your brain notice a fluctuation in pitch, even though it's not even there. Psychologically, you perceive a change. Um, and of course, the more obvious one that I like to use is in the end, they always switch off installations. So it ends. So you can perceive it as a beginning and end at some degree. Um, so I've talked a bit about that. Um, so it often revolves around controlling the rate of change. And it doesn't mean that I primarily just purely focus in a piece like, for example, like this piece is purely on static and that's what it is and that's what it's going to be. Or this piece is going to be motion and this is exactly what it is. My music kind of fluctuates between the two and it kind of organically contracts and expands um, as the kind of musical drama unfolds in my music. Um, because at the end of the day, I want to create um, a piece of music rather than a piece of conceptual art. That's just an aesthetical decision by me. Both are very valid things. Um, so, as I've said, music can be pretty static. Even the purest sign tone can turn on um, psychoacoustics. Yeah. And so I want to briefly talk about Fading Time, uh, the piece that you'll be hearing today. I'll do it very quickly because it's very long. Well, it's not very long. <laughs> it's only 10, 15 minutes. It's not a two hour jaunt. Don't worry. Um, so it's a piece for solo cello. And it was written for Jovan Markovic of the Quattro Danel. And it essentially explores what I've already mentioned. Stasis of motion over three movements um, through the perspective of timbral color and melodic lines. And specifically looking at how motion can be controlled through timbre because motion, and I've fallen, my, I've fallen myself to this kind of um, fence. Um, it, people always associate motion or kind of movement with rhythm and tempo and kind of high pace or just rhythmic intensity. Um, and it doesn't need to be like that at all. It, it can be through the other parameters such as harmonic change and timbre. And I think this piece in itself kind of highlight, hopefully highlights this. I don't want to sound too confident because music's subjective. Um, and so the three movements has this overall trajectory of starting with kind of a, a thing that's very traditionally in, you would perceive in motion um it's very line driven and it's kind of very rhythmic um i will share my screen ah, can i can i be host please <laughs> so that the people know what i'm on about <laughs> there we go right here you go can can you nod if you see that because i don't trust technology at all great so this is the first movement and as you can see it's 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 very line driven it's got a very bold opening it's singing and it's capitalizing on the kind of natural tone quality of a cello and what it can do really well. And that's producing a really nice tune basically. Um, and it kind of uh, it highlights the main reference points of the piece. So in the opening two lines, you've got this singing cantable idea followed by a fragment of pizzicato here, which occurs at different points in the piece followed by some natural harmonics. Now, skipping along, um, this is a very brief whistle stop tour, otherwise I could spend hours just dissecting everything. So feel free to ask questions at the end. That's just, this is just kind of a, this is what I'm doing in a very quick synopsis um, because the music is more important than the dots in my opinion. So the second movement is basically the in-between between stasis and motion. It explores kind of the in-between of the two and fluctuates between kind of written metered notation and free notation, which you can see automatically from the beginning. It opens with kind of obviously notated material, but then moves into kind of a, a kind of more freely interpreted section there of the tremolos. Um, and in particular at the climax here, it then dissolves really into a kind of a almost freely notated kind of thing. There is obviously a bit of guidance by me on that part, but there's a lot of kind of flexibility, for example, in the repeat free section of how many times a performer can do that and how long kind of they can hold on to these tremolos. Um, and at this point here, the um, first idea or the first theme of the first movement comes back um, just as kind of a reflection before it then shatters into um, kind of the more textural timbre ideas which you can see um, here with the shifting of positions for multiple ponce or tasto and 
likewise. And the reason for that is, is just to give it the shifting in color and going back to what I said is about um, motion through the kind of lens of Tambra and just creating different colors from kind of this, a very similar idea. Um, now I'm gonna focus more so on the third movement because it kind of relates a lot to more this idea of stasis because this is where it is fully formed as kind of a static idea. The third movement is based all upon like open string drones, as you can see, with harmonics over the top, which, which feature both as kind of a natural and artificial harmonics. They both feature in this. Um, and the use of the mute also gives a very nice contrast to a very dramatic middle movement. Um, and it creates a really intimate tone, as well as solving a very crucial balance problem of where the open strings are dampened, but the harmonics are not. So they kind of ping out quite nicely it levels it out. Um, however, this movement acts as kind of a recapitulation of the three movements where they're all played attacker, um, where little fragments of each movement reappear. Um, so in particular, this section here at bar 16 through to, the, through to 18 is a brief, very brief fragment of the opening melody in movement one through the use of the flattened seventh. And then you've got the reoccurring pizzicato idea here and here, which you would see at the very beginning as well. Um, as well as that, you've got kind of the timbral kind of trills essence there. And basically these drones act as kind of a root and kind of grounding to the piece, but also allows me to depart harmonically from what's going on. And I think actually this movement is quite nice as a conclusion because Previously, the other two movements are quite not ungrounded, but they, they do move without kind of much of an anchor. They shift quite freely. Um, but this one actually allows some form of kind of grounding and kind of basis to the entire piece. Um, and so I'm aware of the time, so I will probably start playing it to you so I don't run over and you can ask me awkward questions if you want, but preferably nice questions are also very much welcome. <laughs> So here we go. I'm going to stop sharing so I make sure I do the audio right. Da, da, da. Yeah, cool, cool. Bang, bang. No, you don't want to unloop. Here you go. Hope you enjoy. <laughs>
There we go. You never quite know when it's finished with that one. <laughs> I suppose that, that's how you know that it worked, right? <laughs> yeah, when does it start and when does it end? Yeah, it really does fade, fade into thin air. Anyway. Beautiful. Does anyone have any questions, Cameron? Yeah, cool. Is it Ruben? Yeah. Uh, hi, Cameron. First of all, congratulations. Uh, it's a wonderful piece. Uh, I have some uh, questions. Are you a cellist? Or do no. You, you are? No, I just, okay. I have several friends who are cellists and it went through a several rounds of vetoing before it reached kind of the professional one. Okay, well, obviously, through your friends or whatever sources you have, you have really explored the possibilities of the instrument, uh, at least uh, in the style that you're trying to write or what you're trying to write or what you're writing actually. So um, I commend you for that. Um, obviously it's a uh, indispensable stage in composing anything for any instrument or the voice or whatever. Um, I also congratulate you for uh, having such a wonderful cellist perform the piece. I mean, he certainly, it's terrific. And for what I can hear and tell, he's playing on a first rate instrument too. So uh, those were my my comments. I cannot comment on the composition itself, uh, except that I like it. <laughs> More than that, at this point, uh, it would require a great deal of analysis. Well, thank you for your calm words. <laughs> um, it does mean a lot. I mean, the harmonics in that was just a minefield. Like anyone that knows me, because there's a few Manchester people, the third movement just drove me nuts at trying to work out what was possible. It was like musical Sudoku in the end. Of figuring out on the open strings of what what strings do I actually can can I use, um, but yeah, it worked out in the end. But it was a, sometimes a lot of problem problem solving, um, and also just having a natural harmonic spreadsheet in front of me to know what's what's possible. That's basically how I figured things out. Tell me about the the cellist that we just heard. Uh, what other things have he done? Has he done? Is he uh, playing solo, is he teaching, is he playing in an orchestra, what is he doing? Um, so Jevan, I should really have said that, oops. Um, Jevan Malkovich is a member of the Quattro Danal, so they're the kind of resident um, string quartet in Manchester, but they're based in Belgium, I think, and kind of that side, and yeah, they're just stunning musicians. Um, wonderful, wonderful. And also, like, so. it, it should yeah, go without saying, but they're really keen on new music too which is a bit like gold dust really. Like you can chuck them anything and they'll think, oh yeah, that's possible. Um, that's exactly something I was going to address, which is very nice for uh, young composers to have such accomplished players championing their music. And that's an important step how to get there, you know, so again, I don't want to take any more time, but congratulations. Thank you very much. I think card words is always always welcome in this weird time anyway. I think we're very quick to judge people and never quick enough to go actually well done sometimes. Not this is about me, just more of a general comment. I'm waffling anyway, Ronnie. <laughs> yeah, just to, well, to second what Ruben said, um, also about I mean, the, the last movement I liked the most with the, I mean, especially the, just the sonority of the harmonics and stuff. And, and those little, um, uh, some of those salt ponty cello passages were really nice as well. And yeah, the cellist as well was uh, uh, great that he is championing your work like that as well, like Ruben said. Um, and you, you asked, um, uh, Asked to ask you an awkward question, so I might like ask you an awkward question. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, sure. I, I had a compliment on one of them, so I need, I need to, I need to have a stick <laughs> on the other. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, time that you're investigating time was wicked. 
so that, that's where the awkwardness goes. So um, I want to know um, what you feel time is and what's your experience of time? Oh, that's a can of worms, <laughs> isn't it? Um, so I'm going to preface all this by saying <laughs> time, is, time is a very subjective thing and is very unique to one's own experience and that one's perception of time is unique to individuals. So that's the legal bit out of the way to get me out of any academic rabbit holes. Um, for me, I don't know, for time for me academically is something very different. Actually, no, I wouldn't say it's different. Yeah, I mean, I think you're talking in terms of like clock time and then experiential yeah. time and so yeah. academic time and then <laughs> what, we, time never what we actually uh, um, experience. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I've, Elliot Carter, I mean, he wrote a really good, I did a lecture on actually this whole multi-layered aspect of time that's really useful. Um, it's only a couple pages, but yet yeah, he somehow... Mm -hmm. blew my mind as a master's student at how he could just kind of dissect all these fundamental th aspects that contribute to our own kind of psychological experience of time but yeah I think what interests me personally is the whole aspect of like we, we normal human beings perceive time quite metrically and mathematically where one second is one second and mm -hmm. what 60 of them equate into a minute and then 60 of them equate into an hour um, but yeah, music really doesn't function like that. Neither does like plays, for example. You could write a page of dialogue, for example, and it could take a minute or 60 seconds, just as a kind of a throwaway thing. But for music, similarly, you could write a page of music. Well, we've all had that depressing experience of writing fast music, where one page of music is like 10 seconds. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet, if you shove it at Quaver equals 92, then, it, oh, suddenly it's a two-minute piece. Perfect. <laughs> I will meet that deadline. Um, it, I mean, we joke about it, but I think that's kind of a... It's a fundamental thing of the way we write, really. And it's and kind of the way we grapple with it. Yeah, we can't control it, but we can manipulate the listeners into thinking different mm -hmm. things about... How, it, how they perceive the music to be moving rather than them moving through it because that's more of a unique experience and I can't control that, if that makes any sense. You could get um, into the right philosophical rabbit hole. Yeah, I mean, definitely. It's, that's it, why it's an awkward question. Spend hours talking about it and be really interesting and yet still Not have, get anywhere. <laughs> not get anywhere, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, there is a... It's, Elliot Carter's time lecture is amazing. Right. Um, judges you may on his music because some people it's very hit it's like marmite people either love it or they really dislike it and they think it's too academic um but yeah he, he hit the nail on the head with kind of aspects of time i think right. um he provided groundwork anyway i'll stop waffling about yeah. that that was a really good question and that wasn't awkward at all it was a gift oh great <laughs> i'm glad to hear it um I, I've got another question, but since it's, it's all about, um, we're all talking about time, it might be interesting to ask um, someone else as well. I was just wondering about the difference in perception, the the variant, um, the variation in perception of time that listeners have, and also um, between performers. Um, I don't know if that's something you have much experience with or... Yeah, I mean, it it's quite nice interesting. Time. Again, another really good book is called Being Time. Um, oh. Uh, it's really good because they take really extreme pieces of music that are wholly based on type, like aspects of time. So, like the first chapter on like Morton Feldman's um, piano, violin, viola, that one. Right. Um, and they kind of take a listener's perspective from it, and they kind of they talk about how they perceive the music to be developing. But then on the next kind of chapter or sub chapter they flip it and actually talk about it academically so it's a really nice kind of contrast and all the authors are kind of composers as well because i think gossip stocks in there as well um right. brin what's his face brin harrison who's also a time guy in huddersfield um it's really interesting it's related to that point um largely because you can't control it completely but you can influence it um and really, as a composer, I'm not really one to stick. I'm a bit. I'm a bit of a fence sitter. I, I don't. I don't stick my flag in the sand and go right. You're going to perceive this. Um, I kind of leave things to a bit of interpretation. Like for example, the free bits for the performer um, in that piece. 
it did actually involve a bit of communication of how long I wanted it. Because mm -hmm. some bits you went off like a rocket, but then actually I was like, no, you can take a bit more time because it sounds nice. So there is that aspect to it. But as well, I think at the end of the day, for, in my opinion, you can't tell the listener what to do or what to experience. <laughs> you can guide them to some degree, but I think, in my opinion, it's a bit of a dangerous game. And you kind of relinquish some of the joy in kind of experiencing live music, I think, if you kind of lay out an entire roadmap of the kind of what they're meant to experience. Mm -hmm. I mean, if people can disagree. I'm fully open yeah. to criticism on that one. It's a very That's much a personal true. approach from me. Um, but yeah, I hope that answered your question. I really Thank you very much. It's really interesting. I'll have a look. Anyway, Murray, yes, yes. <laughs> Sorry, you've been waiting very patiently. Yes. Well, I'm a psychologist, so I have loads of patients. Oh, no. Oh, uh, no. You made the mistake of using the, the term uh, psych psychological several oh, times. Oh. <laughs> I I've landed them. myself in it this time. <laughs> uh, what, I, what I was interested in here was more of the qualitative psychological sequelae that came out in terms of what it evoked uh, from movement to movement. And I just wanted to get your opinion on this. I'm sure you weren't going for this, but when you hear my comment, I wonder if it fits in with some of the schema. Uh, in the first movement, is especially in part of it, there's almost like a Yiddish lullaby quality to it. In the second movement, it appears in, in terms of what it's evoking in me psychologically is more of a dark and sinister quality. And in the third movement, there's what I would call a solemn quality. So how would you respond to that? Um, actually, other than the first movement, which took me by a bit of surprise, but I'm not surprised in one way because it's modal anyway. Um, uh, you actually hit the nail on the head, really. Um, those were kind of the moods I was going for, generally. Because um, the middle movement is kind of more of the kind of dramatic centerpiece. It's also the longest movement. So I kind of wanted it to kind of have that kind of darker quality. And likewise, I think because of the drone as well, it can't, in the third movement, it kind of has that natural kind of solemn, not funeral marchy, but y you know what I mean, kind of that vibe I don't know I'm trying to phrase it very nicely like you started in your sentences but I can't do that <laughs> um but yeah that that was basically what I was going for yeah excellent excellent it's not well, it's you, not a very exciting answer I know um well, well, I'd love you, to disagree. Clearly, you clearly achieved what uh what I what I was hoping you you would you know excellent uh, I have a question if it's a, if it's okay um I was wondering to what extent your like your purpose in sort of fading time from the piece informed the proportions that you kind of laid out for each movement because obviously the way we experience time will be different depending on how the music progresses and I was just wondering how it influenced the structure in a way yeah um, so it's interesting how you mentioned proportions because I do I do plan out my proportions not really diligently but there's a the, in some ways it's kind of more deliberate than it may seem um, so the actual it was a very deliberate choice to start with a really short movement like the opening movements only like a minute and a bit I think um, and then have a really big middle and then a slightly medium length end the large, large to, yeah, the, the largely for this was because I find kind of very symmetrical blocks a bit boring now. Um, mm. And I, th I was just trying to figure out ways that are a bit more interesting. And considering it's all attacker as well, um, it kind of, it did go in for like a three in one structure where you wouldn't really feel the, the downbeat or double bar line of each movement but they were there more so for kind of structural purposes, if that makes sense. Um, likewise, you can perform the movements individually, but I would be a bit tentative. 
um, because you kind of mess up the narrative a bit, but you can do it theoretically. I've put it in the program notes of how to end certain movements if you know if they're doing it that way. Um, but in the way it reflects kind of their perception of time in the own work, I mean, th they did have subtitles to begin with, and then I got rid of them because they were math. Um, but the middle movement, for example, was called fluctuations. Um, and the whole concept behind that was basically this movement's about <laughs> fluctuating between kind of ideas of strongly metered stuff and non-metered stuff. And it was more about blurring one's, own, the listener's perception of what's one or t'other. Because if you hear kind of the tremolo stuff, you would, you could kind of hammer in a pulse if you wanted to, but it's actually not. Um, it's largely down to the player to decide what that's all about. Um, and then the kind of more metered stuff really does its best job to blur the sense of a downbeat through changing time signatures, you know, ties and all that. So there is that element. I don't know if that's asking, answering your question effectively, or I am just waffling on a tangent. Um, but yeah, it kind of wanted to do this where it goes up and down, goes down again, up again, and then drops off a cliff, basically. That kind of two peaks, but one larger than the other structure. Um, so yeah, that, that's a, I think that's answered it, I hope. <laughs> Yeah. We'd say no, do it again, but better. It, it's in a way, they're not really movements for Nardo, they're, they're more like sections of the piece. Because, like, if you were to take them out of that context, then they would lose their purpose, no? Or not if you really, because the way I designed the music was <laughs> um, because the musical content is unique in each movement. In themselves um the only benefit of having all three one after another is that you get this idea of non-linear progression of kind of reference points of mm -hmm. ideas that occur in all three movements but um i do actually feature proof it by going um you can perform any movements and selections and also the numbers are there structurally as well it's very deliberate that they're three different entities mm -hmm. rather than a b a because I don't know, it, I'm experimenting with this idea of a mixed form um, because in, there's the, like there's Beethoven sonatas that are called movement three or movement two, but they're attacker. So it's been done um, to push back on that, which is a very valid question. <laughs> uh, one question to complement or, or based on what I think Eliora means by proportion. Um, I don't think that many composers will decide on the proportion on one movement regarding to the other or the length of a movement before they start actually doing the piece. Uh, a lot of time, I believe, uh, I was a composer and not a very good one and soon I abandoned it, but in any case, I believe that uh, the proportion of a movement or the proportions of a piece will evolve as the composer is working on it. And very many times with a basic plan, a basic idea, you realize that uh, it has taken a life of its own and you developed it to a point and in the direction that originally we didn't intend it. Is that your experience also? Um, it's depend. It's, I'm going to give a naff answer and say it depends on the piece. Um, I wish it wasn't true, but it is a bit. Sorry. Um, but for this one, it, it was more of a deliberate challenge to do it this way. It was always going to be a case of the first movement's going to be the shortest, or you know, blah. I've already mentioned it. But like, I think you can have a general gist of how long, not to the point of like it's going to be two minutes and thirty seconds on the dot. But I think generally I'm more like, right, this is going to be the bigger bit and this bit's going to be kind of half that bit. It's not to the point of where I have it precisely kind of down to the number of bars. It's just more of a rough guesstimate or kind of just like a, a wooden framework of which to build upon. That's what I meant. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I also think like as a composer, I, from my experience, I, I find there are different types of musical materials that 
take up a different space in time. And I think that's one of the things that I find interesting about this piece is that um, you you have a very just I feel like that's very distinct, like the the musical gestures and the musical motifs are very very clearly occupy different amounts of time. And I think by using these and by controlling like the alternate alternation between these kind of sounds and, and motifs and things, you can control time quite effectively in that sense. Is, is that I mean, do you agree with that? Yeah, completely. I mean, to be fair, I think the one thing I've developed this year and still kind of working on is kind of sensitivity to the actual material I'm using. Mm. Um, and it kind of takes a lot of time. I mean, yeah, obviously working away from a computer, but actually kind of truly letting things breathe has kind of been a big focus of mine this year, um, which is similar to the idea of pacing and kind of also kind of the auditory process of the material. That sounds a really posh way of basically saying how listeners hit like process the music. Sorry, I should, <laughs> but like it, listeners kind of perceive things differently. Like fast material always needs to be played twice for them to get the musical material. Mm -hmm. So I think it's something I've thought a lot more about this year than I have previously. But yeah, you're definitely right. It it's a real it's a bit of a dark art in composition, understanding how much space a piece needs or an idea needs um i think we anyway enough about me. running over by about half an hour or so already but it was really really lovely thank you so much cameron it was absolutely fascinating so well done <laughs> pleasure having me uh for having me i'm sorry i've overrun i do apologize who, who do you want the hot seat next as I am, as I'm the host. <laughs> I think we're moving on to, uh, was it Kat Katarina Wallace? Yeah, if you could pass it over to me. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Great, I'm just gonna share my screen quickly and hopefully this works. Uh, can you see a PowerPoint? Great. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> like a really short introduction of um so I'm Kat, I also go by Katarina, don't really mind which. Um and uh so I'm just coming to the end of my masters in composition at Royal Birmingham Conservatoire and the piece I'm gonna present is something I've been working on um for quite a few months this year. Um it's called the Waves, Tides, Ripples and uh, I wrote it for flute, santor, and film. Um, so, like, the way this piece came about is uh, back in December, I was introduced to this um, sort of collective that is called the Arc Project, and they they sort of specialise in um, by introducing composers and performers so that they can collaborate on various projects. And they were running a, a project called the art project digital edition um and so like to match up composers um during lockdown uh with performers and so the composers would write a new piece for them uh the performers could then record it in like isolation um we could then mix it together create a youtube video that would then get promoted on their channel um so i decided to sign up for it and uh I got paired with the lovely Avazad Fusion duo, who are both here today. Um, yeah, so that's kind of, I'm just going to talk like a little bit of kind of about like the process of how I sort of went about composing the piece and then like I'll play the piece at the end. Uh, so I guess like the first step for me writing this piece was actually researching just about the Santor because it, I've written for flute several times before, but the Santor was something completely new to me. Um, uh, so I like sort of looked up like, how it, it, how to play it. Um, it's played with these like very light hammers called Mesrab. Um, and like I had a lovely Zoom call with Eliora and Atifa, and Atifa also introduced me to the um, extended techniques. Um, you can actually like bow uh, the Santor, which is a really amazing sound. Um, and then like I looked into sort of kind of 
other things like uh, tunings because it's not a chromatic instrument so you sort of pick your like pitch set and that's your pitch set for your piece and it's very important to know beforehand and I also just like listen to examples um, to sort of know what people typically play um, and then sort of moving on to like the more musical like moving on to looking at more musical ideas um, I kind of I spent a long time not really knowing what I wanted to like base the piece around um, the idea of microtonality was sort of in my head um, as I know Avazad have worked with microtonality before um, and I've kind of been introduced uh, like interested in trying it before and this kind of so it felt like the perfect time to test it out with performers that are like, very experienced in it. Um, I was in particular interested in um, a couple of things in microtonality. I'd come across um, uh, a neutral third, which is an interval that lies between a major and minor third. And I think I often struggle using thirds in like the harmony of my pieces just because like the weight of what like a major third implies such a major key and a minor third can imply just like all the sadness and everything all the history and for me like a neutral third was just like the perfect middle ground um and then also uh Eliora showed me um uh, she demonstrated like a, a microtonal trill in one of our zoom calls where she was just fluctuating up and down um a quarter tone and that's sort of like a sound I really latched on to, like just wanted to use in something. Uh, and like whilst thinking of these ideas, I also always had in the back of my mind that I needed to create a video to go with the piece um, because it was being put on YouTube. Um, so I, I kind of, I'm quite interested in using film in my work in general. I've written pieces before where um, the, the film is sort of its own, entity that's projected behind performers and I kind of like working in that sort of multimedia way having like a visual that accompanies the music I thought like I wanted to make sure I had something that worked in that way and I guess sort of the the final bit of like coming up with the ideas was um a lot of my work is inspired by nature and this year with all the lockdowns I actually ended up living by the sea for the first time in my life um and like it was I guess a bit of nature that I'd only been exposed to on like holiday and stuff so it seemed like a really great chance to like spend time by the sea and kind of get in take inspiration from it and also um one of my friends um was describing waves in a different completely different piece of music um as he used the phrase regular irregularity um, to describe them. And like that was the moment I had like the light bulb moment of this is this is what my piece is gonna be based on. <laughs> it's just the regular irregularity of waves. So that's kind of like the background to the ideas. Um, so this is kind of now like what I kind of aimed to make with this piece. Um, so I kind of wanted to create a piece that is like constantly moving but also kind of meditative and kind of staying still not really going anywhere um I want something that feels like you could listen to it forever it's just kind of constantly drifting moving. um I wanted to make sure it never repeated itself exactly I think that's quite a challenge for me because I often I do use repeats a lot in my music um and I was very keen on focusing on a very small amount of material. Um, both parts actually spend the majority of their time only focusing on two notes and then they'll move on to another pair of notes. And it's all just very focused. Um, uh, another thing is, so the, the piece, I wanted to imitate sort of the back and forth feel of the sea um, in the music. Um, and one of that, one part of that is using the quarter tone trills that I mentioned kind of mimics the undulating of the well waves um I guess the final part is it was a great opportunity to actually go and film the sea um so and then like, having all of this 
like planned out and then sort of started writing thinking about everything that like I've planned what I'm aiming for the piece so I was writing this flute part that sort of meanders between these notes sort of always changing never quite the same but it kind of still feels like it's regular because it's repeating but it's irregular because it's not the same um and then I started writing the Santor part um which was a real struggle for me um it felt anything I wrote in accompaniment to the flute part felt very unnatural it just it no it didn't really fit anything that I notated felt very wrong um but I spent some time sort of like listening to the playback of the flute part and improvising myself to it and anything that I improvise and I'm a very bad improviser <laughs> kind of just sounded better than anything notated so I wanted to then create something some sort of notation that allowed the performers to kind of freely um like improvise with the rhythm of the piece essentially so I started looking at graphic notation for um the Santor part um, I wanted to specify the pictures because I'd already settled on settled on the pictures I was going to use, and then I've I've drawn a line um, that uh, can it dictates the dynamics of the piece as well as the um, the speed of the tremolo. So I've got like a the Santor part is always alternating between notes, and the wave also controls that. Um, I'll just show you a bit of the score here. So. Um, yeah, so you see the flute part is kind of notated fairly conventionally, and then the Santor part has got this line. Um, like the height of the line is um, how loud it is, so the higher it is, the louder it is. Like the lowest point, I think, on this bit is right at the beginning, so it starts very quiet. Um, and the darkest bits of the line, where there's like the shading, is like the faster tremolo, and the lighter bits are, or the single line, are slower. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Uh, I see Ronnie's hand, yeah. Yeah, um, how, do you, how, how on earth do you do that in finale? I could never do a <laughs> line like that. Um, it, it's actually done in paint. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, I, I also had this issue. Um, I, I wrote the like the flute part out in um, Sibelius and then I had a load of empty bars. Um, right. And then like I exported it and then uh, I like my laptop touch screen, so I I just drew in the lines. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so it's all done on the paint.net. <laughs> right. Which I would recommend, but I think there's also, if you're more like graphic designs, like, like if you're better with graphic design, there are better programs for it. <laughs> okay, good to know. Thank you. <laughs> As a beginner program, paint.net is highly recommended. <laughs> right. Um, yeah so there's a uh, another bit and you can see in the boxes i've specified like the pitches and where to change pitch uh, and so like the final bit i just want to talk about is the filming of the film um so i spent uh i filmed in over like several days i took lots of different angles of the sea so i kind of had lots of footage um to work from and i after looking at it all i decided to just go for maintaining one wide shot um and it i think it just works a lot better with the piece um or any cut i put in felt very uh disjointed it just it didn't work with the music at all so gone with this like one wide shot um and it's i think it would work in a live context as well um to be like projected behind performers um if they're playing in a concert um and yeah so the uh, the flute and Santor parts were recorded separately. Eliora recorded her flute part first. I then mixed it and sent it across to Artifa and she uh, she did listen to the flute part whilst um, recording. So I think that, that was like the closest we could get to like a live interaction when we couldn't get the performers together. Um, and I think it worked. I'm very happy with the result of like that sort of process. Um, and yeah, and then I mixed it together with the film and the audio. And uh, if I, I'll just give the control and she can share the video. Uh, okay, 
So I've yeah, Artifus, if you could share the video. And we'll just play as much as we've got time for, I think. I don't know how long we've got time for, maybe like seven minutes, is that okay?
Uh, does anyone have any questions? Thank you. <laughs> I have a question, Kat. Hi, Ruben. What's your question? Um, the flute and the santor were tuned to a different pitch. Was that intended? Uh, they're not. Um, so they're not quite. I did maybe tune's not the right word, but they. Um, when, when I, what I mean is that when they play to what I assume you intended to be the same pitch, they are not. Um, they're often pitched a quarter tone apart. Okay. So they spend a lot of time kind of nearly the same pitch, but not quite. Okay. And I kind of like playing in that space of kind of sounding not perfectly in tune. I quite like it. <laughs> so obviously it was intended. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's all. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, from a practical point of view, <laughs> I'm just wondering if this were to be performed like live mm -hmm. together and um, and we were improvising a quarter tone apart is is th that that could be quite difficult and <laughs> just because getting the tuning right i mean i i i on my own i was okay mm. to work out the tuning and um, because it was all relative to what i was doing but if i was then playing with someone else he was a quarter tone apart from me. <laughs> yeah. I was wondering whether you you'd thought about how that would work. I think I hadn't particularly thought of that actually, just because um I think like I I am not someone that's always that I don't tend to have an issue if people are out of tune a lot of the time. Mm. And especially in a piece like this, I think I, I'm not in a way, I kind of think it adds more colour to the piece if you're not perfectly in tune. Um, mm. So, um, yeah, I think to me, because the, the tuning of it's not so precise, mm -hmm. um, I think that would, in a way, make it a little bit easier in practice of performing it. But it would be a sort of case of, like, we need to try out and see what happens in practice. Yeah. <laughs> Can I ask a follow-up question? Yeah. Uh, so basically, what you talk about uh, neutral thirds, mm -hmm. well, first of all, I don't know what you mean by that, because as you know, uh, beginning with the Greeks, uh, uh, they, there are different kinds of thirds, different kinds of major thirds, different kinds of minor thirds. So I yeah. don't know what you mean by by neutral thirds, but in the case where the instruments are tuned a quarter tone apart, practically every interval that they it occurs between the two is not a tempered instrument, uh, either a, a, a whole tone or a half a tone or whatever. All of the intervals are bent up or down according to to, to what they're doing. And I'm not referring only to the flute part that obviously she's bending the tones to achieve those quarter tones, et cetera. Hmm. So could you define better what you mean by uh, neutral thirds? I don't, um, I don't understand what you mean. I guess I, the neutral third is something I'm more, it's more solely explored within the Santor part. So the Santor part is tuned to itself. Um, in a way, and the, the the thirds mostly occur in that part. Um, so they are um, tuned to be. So it's the I think one of the most common ones is F to A quarter flat, um, which is so it's yeah it, it's it kind of sounds to me it sounds neither major nor minor, and it's something where that um, the quarter flat lies halfway between the natural and the flat to create that. Does that help explain it? Yes, well? it does. And I want to commend you for going back to that because we have been so indoctrinated and in my opinion, poisoned by equal temperament 
that we lose the beauty of the natural harmonics uh, that can be created with a different kind of of tuning. Yeah, you're obviously going. You're going back to to some of that concept, and and I'm happy you do. Thank you. Yeah, it's. I think micro talent here opens up some really interesting doors in terms of harmony. Like it gives you a lot more choice and there's so many different ways you can explore harmony with microtonality like this like you can explore it kind of in more like the quarter tones um or you can go to like 31 tone equal temperament there's there's it's just you've got a lot of options and i think and it makes it a lot more exciting <laughs> but i am very glad that you're aware of all of that and you're using all of that and absorbing all of that and then creating what you're creating Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Uh, Ronnie. Yeah, I mean, again, uh, the uh, this uh, third, I think that was the concept, the idea was quite clear um, for me. I was just wondering if, because um, uh, you, yeah, it's like, what's it called? Santor and the flute. Yeah. Um, I mean, to me, I just hear sort of um, uh, music from either, uh, either Far East or the Middle East uh, together that um, would often have some variations of you know, quarter tones like that. And so, um, uh, and you know, like, um, I think they're called makams in the different scales you have. Yeah, I think yeah. that's kind of in the Middle East. The santor yeah. is originally, so the type of santor that's in this one is Iranian. Uh, right. It's not a map on. Yeah, but slightly different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Sorry, sorry, where do you say it was Iranian then? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and right. it's like dash how do you say it properly? Dash gas. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm no expert, I just know that um, my cubs are different, <laughs> where they have the different scales um, and some of them have a kind of like a, a really out of tune tone sometimes. So that's sort of what it reminded me of. I wondered if uh, you were thinking of that as, at all as well. Um, yeah, so when I was researching the Santor, I kind of discovered like all of this like traditional music that it often plays and it is, they do like in dash cars, they they use um it's it's like their own tonality um that is like they have different pitches that they use mm -hmm. and um and i kind of that was also like one of the reasons i like was kind of looking at this and like um i i wasn't taking like in a way directly from it but i kind of saw it as like a chance to like this instrument is capable of doing this and right. um, and then sort of went from there rather than like, I wasn't kind of taking things directly from it, if that makes sense. Right. I'm more yeah. just from seeing what it was capable of. Because right. yeah, I, I sort of found that the, the definite sort of sonority was out of uh, Western um, tradition, like out of the major minor thing and more sort of you know, like eastward somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I guess uh, the neutral third is very common kind of, I think the further east you go, it is right. something that pops up and um microtonality in general yeah i think like the santor was tuned in a, a dashgar um mm -hmm. but i kind of i like composed like it all kind of intuitively so i wasn't thinking like in like harmonic structures when i was doing it i was just kind of finding what flowed all right lovely thank you very much thank you uh, ziggy i can't hear you ziggy I can't hear you, Ziggy. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, brilliant. Thank you. Sorry, it's an absolute pleasure to hear your work, firstly. Um, it's the second time I've heard this piece, and it's just, it's absolutely stunning like the way that you've used both the flute and santor textures is just phenomenal. Uh, the question I wanted to pose is kind of kind of coming off from what Ruben was saying. Um, 
as to whether kind of your use of microtonality both here and maybe in your practice kind of going forward is kind of is that more of a practical thing knowing that you had to write for the santor or was it more kind of influenced from the more conceptual kind of like like sounds of nature that have influenced you in the past and is that something you'd be interested in kind of putting together in the future and your future practice i think it's um I think I'll say it's probably more conceptual. I think I wasn't very aware of um, sort of much microtonality until last year when um, I came across a piece that was in 31 tone equal temperament. And I sort of saw the concert of this piece and it completely blew my mind. I thought it sounded like amazing. Um, and kind of ever since then, I've wanted to try um, just sort of expanding into microtonality in various different ways so I think and like I saw this as like the opportunity to do to use microtonality um but I think it's something I want to keep doing and kind of linking to like nature it feels I think I like to use harmony very like intuitively and having more options I think works a lot better for me in some pieces it doesn't work better in all pieces but like depending on the concept of the piece I think having that option to work in but like having more options works a lot better sorry yeah of course I completely understand that and um working with the Avazad guys I can definitely tell that you really came into your own with kind of the use of kind of microtones particularly with the the natural third um I know Ruben you had a lot to say on that but yeah that first yeah thank you so much for presenting this it's been absolutely lovely thanks i have a question yeah <laughs> um just in terms of uh sort of this concept of time mm -hmm. uh, just sort of to add my, my perspective of, of one of the reasons why i feel like it's it really, really fits into this theme so well, and, and to this idea of the state that you go into, is from my experience as performing the piece, was how disorientating, how unbelievably disorientating it is. The rhythms themselves, are, like, are fine, but like you wouldn't think, you wouldn't hear it when you're listening to it. You don't hear how much like ticking was going in my head. Like, because every single entry point was slightly different from the other but and you just you, you really really lose sense of time and it's it's amazing because when you watch when you watch it with a video and, and like when I, it's such a different experience from playing it when you watch it with the video you suddenly see oh wow it's so organic it sounds like i'm making up from the start and um i i think that's a a, a, a real sign that, that, that a composer can write well if they can create something that sounds like it's improvised or sounds really intuitive because that's really hard to you know compose something that sounds like that so, thank you one, <laughs> thank you uh, the other thing that i wanted to ask actually was did you have any kind of trajectory in mind when you uh wrote this piece were you matching the rhythms like to the actual tides and the waves were you actually using something tangible to cr come up with that or i wasn't i was kind of just doing it all um so like i had spent time kind of like i spent a lot of time just sitting at the sea watching waves but i hadn't i wasn't like listening to the video and then writing it i was kind of almost doing it from memory and kind of thinking that like it didn't need I didn't want it to sync up like perfectly I wanted that kind of natural like if it syncs up it syncs up if it goes out of sync it and just kind of like that sort of natural ebb and flow of them like coming together and then moving apart mm -hmm. and I also kind of tried to do that with the flute and santor parts like there's points where you really like merge together and you're really kind of almost like doing something together like complete together and then you go off on your own path and that's kind of what I wanted I wanted like almost like three independent parts kind of doing your own kind of like ebbing and flowing and sometimes joining together and sometimes moving apart 
that's kind of what I was aiming for when I was like kind of structuring the piece I guess and I was just trying to constantly kind of create this balance between the parts doing it mm-hmm. yeah I mean to be honest I don't think there's any way you could possibly synchronize it with the sea because you have to, there's so many different waves going at the same time like how are you even going to to know what the listener or the, or the viewer is going to be focusing on like there's yeah. no way of doing that so it makes sense I, guess. I think a lot of people also watch the clouds Ah, <laughs> I've I've shown it to a couple of people and they've commented on the clouds because you can you can visibly see them moving across the sky. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Any more questions, or should we move on? I think we should move on. If if there aren't any more questions, can't I can't tell because I can't. Yeah. I think that's yeah. I I can't see anymore. <laughs> Okay, so um, who who has who has host uh, who's host uh, Atafa? You're going to do you're going to put on the music for the next piece, right? So it's probably good if you stay host. Great. So now we're going to move on to Imande. Imande. Oh, well. um, uh, I can I can be host for a while because I want to show the score and then uh, the music I, I will give it. Okay, so hello, good, good evening. Uh, my name is Raymond, and I am Lithuanian uh, composer. And uh, currently, I like right now, I I am living in Salzburg in Austria, but uh, uh, yeah, I'm Lithuanian. And uh, to talk about me, I graduated uh, already. <laughs> in all kind of uh, composition. Uh, studies, even doctoral studies, I graduated uh, last year, and the, the I needed to write uh, also thesis, because in Lithuania when we study doctorate, there's really a big load of work is uh, theoretical thesis, um, like 50-50, so my thesis were about neo-Riemannian theory, it's a the- like music analysis system which deals with, uh, which, uh, yeah, with the triads, but in non-functional harmony. For example, late romantics or, I know, minimalism or uh, Renaissance. And uh, yeah, so before, when I was younger, uh, I wrote several pieces where I used the exact triad chord, minor, major triad, uh, but the music was not a consonant uh, this, card was just like a cell to build some uh, bigger structures. So at the same time, they were extending many layers of triads and uh, the result was not not the classical tonality. But uh, then I moved away from this because somehow I felt like I don't want to stay for long uh, in the same. And uh, in the recent years of my path, I noticed that I'm getting super obsessed with uh, with a uh, visual inspiration and exactly with uh, metamorphosis. I really, I love uh, glitch art and uh, also the artist Escher, like this metamorphosis where something like opt art also, optical illusions, uh, all kind of uh, visual phenomena, which uh, shows some kind of dissolving, some morphing, Ah, yeah, I also love, I would love to, I, I can't do this, but I w- would love to learn uh, to program better and, and do this morphing where the picture is going to other picture, like just melting and creating some strange hybrids. And uh, so in music, music uh, in music also, I am, uh, I love processes, some process which uh, slightly changes or sometimes uh, opposite, I like, very sudden change and some like surprise effect and uh, um, yeah and uh, um, so yeah recently in my pieces I'm also like trying to either I'm either doing this like slight uh, metamorphosis or or some more like energetic like uh, fast changes but uh, yeah, so I, I, I also would say that it's important the energy 
I don't know, I, I like the like, big, big mass uh, of sound and multi layers. And because I, mm, from the aesthetic point of view, I like heavy music, where there's like something slow and heavy. And yeah, um, now I remember that I forgot to, I wanted to say before starting to speak about myself, I wanted to say compliments to the uh, two composers before me. Uh, because when you presented, I somehow was like, okay, I will, I will wait. But uh, yeah, really nice pieces, very organic, very natural sounding. And uh, this is it also, it might be, uh, I think, for example, in the second piece about the uh, sea, the waves, uh, I think this, it was a very good decision, exactly, this graphical notations, because then it allowed this very nice uh, tempo, tempo changes. I was like, especially in the beginning, it was very nice. Uh, and uh, I always struggle with this because I always write with Sibelius. And everybody say like, it's bad. It's bad. It's like, it should not work like straight to Sibelius. But I don't know, I'm lazy to write on papers. I'm creating directly to Sibelius. And this means that my music is sometimes maybe too rigid and too, it lacks this kind of nice, which I want to achieve at the same time. But uh, maybe my chosen means are not along but no. and now uh, shortly also about the topic uh, of this particular forum is that uh, the controlling time and about uh, the su su suspense and uh, anticipation um, when uh, uh, Eliara told me this topic I immediately thought about function theory because when I uh, wrote about now re Riemann theory I also compared it to the functional theory tonica so the nine of nine was just also was discovered by uh, Hugo Riemann uh, the musicologist and uh, and neo Riemannian theory doesn't have so functional theory has this uh, gravitation right like the tonic and, and there's this gravitation and neo Riemannian theory just analyze like the sequence of triads with no no gravitational point uh, one 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 center so um, I was also thinking a lot about this psychoacoustical uh, Mm, uh, per perception of music and how important is to have some points of gravitation and and, and some like suspense in the release and uh, mm, so yeah and uh, maybe now I would uh, move on to the piece I will present tonight my newest piece which was premiered one week ago or like 10 days ago and uh, yeah, the, mm, it was a percussion ensemble and uh, five players. Uh, it was written quite fast, um, but uh, but I somehow I'm happy with the result. And uh, the main idea, so it it calls a quicksand. Although, so because my main idea when I needed to to uh, for this piece was that I want to um, somehow concentrate to the effect of uh, in percussion instruments that uh, you can um, achieve different, uh, like a glissandi of uh, color, for example, with changing uh, the stick, the point where the stick hits the membrane of instrument, the skin of instrument, or for example, where like the stick itself, which point of the stick hits the instrument, and then you get this uh, some slightly color changes um, from darker to, to you know, brighter and so on. But if you do like um, it uh, fluently, then then it creates some kind of like color glissandi. And uh, I just wanted to concentrate on all the playing techniques, uh, extended playing techniques of percussion, which um, has this, um, and the, that's why the first image was like the quicksand that is like something is kind of pulling you. And this also has to do something with gravitation. Um, later when I heard the result, when I heard the result of this piece, uh, it reminded more of, of a rain, rain falling, uh, a storm. But anyway, it has some feeling of, of nature force. Now I will start uh, to. Mm. 
Mm. Okay, so now I'm sharing. Uh, is it, do you see it? Uh huh. Okay. Uh, okay, so since it was Lithuanian players, those are residents in Lithuania, so I this car I don't uh, in Lithuanian, but I will translate. Mm. So yeah, so for example, this effects uh, of glissandi, the color glissandi was, for example, uh, also changing uh, the hand. If you put one hand on the mem uh, skin and then you play and then you, you change the position of the hand, it makes also this. Um, and then, as I said, like the, the, the contact point of, on the stick. And uh, also, if you press uh, the membrane, the, the tone also like some kind of bend, bending, bending of the tone. And uh, so, here's that. And uh, it starts with uh, all five, uh, everybody plays cymbals and doing some waves. So, all together, and then start to, to get like canon. Uh, then uh then it's like the next section uh the snare drum the snare drum uh comes and uh, uh again like some of the players giving like poof, like the impulse and the others having the like response like, doosh, doosh. Uh, then uh there comes the part where not rim knock um where they the instruments are mixed so first they had like uh, or all all the same instruments, and then now we have snare drum, tom tom, uh, cymbal, and then there's, for example, these bands. Um, then I also look like like if we put the paper uh, on the on the on the membrane, and then you like lift one side, it also gives it the sand. And then it, again, it's like so it's like mixed instrument, mixed color section. Then again, we have the section where only tom toms are playing, all five instruments. Then again, and the bass drum, three bass drums playing. And then again, mixed in the end, mixed section. But uh, what uh, this piece itself? It, it, uh, we're now talking about uh, material, like or the rhythmical material. Uh, the several things. Mm -hmm. First, there is this rhythmical idea that uh, it gets the measure gets shorter and shorter. So, for example, uh, here, and it gets like the, the bars you can see, uh, like, um, for example, like it's just four, four fourths, then uh, three fourths, then uh, here, for example, four, four, five bar, then three, four, then five, eight, two, four. So the same is always uh, as, as if it's like the, the ground is falling uh, under your feet and like it's, it's getting always less and less and less and less. Um, then the other thing is that uh, yeah, also the Achillanda uh, Ritadanda I often use in my music. It also like has something to do with, with the, the, the motion of, of coming and falling and then comes on. And then this piece is kind of, uh, as you see, it's like it's quite quite an energetic piece, but uh, through, through, through the piece, there are some uh, small sections like a like a release islands, release of tension, um, where suddenly the instruments just sweeping the surface for some bars. For example, um, like here there was like a intensive part and then sweeping and then coming to the other part again intensive, 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 and then intensive, 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 and then uh, when, um, yeah, again, for example, here, yeah, there was like um, the, the measures were getting shorter and shorter, like uh, four, four, then two, four, then seven, sixteenths, then three, eighths, and then five, sixteenths, so the shortest measure, and then sweep, 
piano and my kind of tension is relieved. Then again, the, again, the, the start and the energetic part. And again, the tension is relieved here on the sweep. And again, then starting the, and the, there's also uh, two sections in the piece that, which has this kind of pause, pause breaks. Uh, and then again, a uh, rhythmical part with getting shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter and shorter. And then uh, in the end, at the very end of the piece, this is like the, uh, we have a lot of pause and the quite quiet part as like finally the storm went went away. And we have like here is the um, sweeping on rim of the instrument. Like, sorry, like, um, yeah. So now, if you now we listen to the piece, it will be very clear what I told because I don't think it was clear now. But uh, so to su summarize it, it, it was uh, uh, the idea of of of, of short turning measures, which are like uh, as if the ground is falling, uh, the the ground is slipping under your uh, feet, and uh, there's some particular moments in the piece of relief of tension, and then again. Um, so please, now uh, we can listen to it. Uh, I, I, I now will make you a uh, host. Uh, wait, huh? Yes, change now. Mm -hmm.
Да, тут. Thank you, Raymond. That was lovely. We don't have much time left. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any pressing questions? <laughs> A little bit over. If not, um, there's the question. Huh? Ah, okay, go on. Um, I just wanted to ask you because you said you were focusing like a lot on sort of like timbre and colour. Um, I was wondering if like whether that specific group of percussion instruments was like given to you or whether you like whether you chose like the cymbal, the snare drum, the bass drum, like what and like if you did choose them, what why did you choose those as opposed to like other percussion instruments? Just because there's so much to explore in percussion. Mm -hmm. True, uh, they were kind of a given. Yeah, there were like snare drums, tom toms, bass drum, and uh, they also had this ensemble. Like this, they had also vibraphone and and uh, marimba, but I didn't want pitched percussion. And then I just like okay, so I just take all kind of drums and uh, and then try to find this kind of. Uh, I don't know. Action this recording, it's maybe not that much hearable because they were very stressed to play this intensive rhythms and sometimes they were forgetting to to like change this position of the sticks or something but uh, but uh, i think i kind of my, my goal was to find the the sand in non-pitched percussion like exactly through this different like very subtle nuances which maybe uh here in the video the sound was not as good but um yeah and also for example in the beginning there was like uh, cymbals uh, tremolo and i was supposed that there was would also be some like color change if you play on the edge or in the center of the symbol but it was not but uh yeah uh also like of course gong and mm, maybe my one of the favorite of course a timpani and you can play so many objects on the timpani mm -hmm. timpani skin, skin but they didn't have <laughs> they didn't have uh, this uh, possibility so uh yes yeah, so, yeah tam tam and gong maybe also would go here but um did you consider putting um because you just mentioned like putting things on the timpani did you consider doing that to the drums that you did use uh i tried i wrote at one point to uh like play triangle placed on bass drum but mm. somehow it was not working as good as i saw uh, in the yeah. video on, on internet oh. uh, and like in reality there was like i don't know there was something wrong with, with this bass drum i was like whatever mm. yeah. but uh, i for this piece i uh i took many uh, playing techniques from the book uh, by i forgot now there is this kind of uh, books of extended playing techniques, which are like in German and uh, in English at the same time. Uh, and uh, and yeah, so I now forgot how it's called this book. But uh, yeah, and this book then has uh, online the multimedia where you can see in the videos, all the examples. Um, that was very helpful. Is that a I have, I have a question for everyone, <laughs> a general question, um, which is um, how consciously were you working to control our experience of time as well as the perception of the piece as a whole? This was uh, mainly because I think all of your pieces have something in common in the sense that they have a very organic development in in sense and that's why I was just wondering to what extent you were controlling time or, or the expansion and contraction of it, or to what extent it was more intuitive. So, Ramon, would you like to start? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I guess into into uh, yeah, yeah somehow. Um, as uh, I mentioned, it was kind of very intensive work. Uh, mm. I wrote this piece maybe in a week or so, 
and uh, I even now I can't recall exactly how uh, because I had this one structure where it's like this bars are like shrinking mm -hmm. and uh, then somehow just listen through and okay so here yeah, we'll put something and then exchange in places mm -hmm. yeah more like uh, intu intuitively and uh, then this effect I discovered on the later that okay actually it's kind of only when they rehearsed I, I felt that there's a sense that it's coming and then it's like this kind of uh, rise and fall of uh, attention but yeah <laughs> And Catherine, Catherine, would you like to? Um, yeah, so I think I was trying to very consciously control time mm -hmm. um, just with, um, but also like in a, a very intuitive way, because I, I, I was just always thinking of the fact that like waves never stop. And that's the thing that I'm sort of looking at as my inspiration. And so um, I kind of wanted a piece that kind of felt the same, like always kind of moving, always there. And I, yeah, so I think I was trying to kind of imitate that same sort of like, almost like timeless feeling. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so, but then like, I guess the contraction and like expansion of it is all kind of done intuitively. But I definitely was going for like a timeless feel. Great. And... Cameron? Yeah, so for me, I've kind of got the philosophy of you can't control time really. And if you try to, you kind of fall on your face because it's an illusion of control because time will always keep on ticking. Or, well, what well, well, our conceived notion of Western time anyway. Um, and similarly, our music functions on the same similar basis, even when you open Spotify. It's, it's runtime is three minutes 33 or whatever um so you've already got that kind of time as what Carter calls it real world time or the, or the layer of time that way um so for me it's more important about the like the perception of it from a listener's perspective and it's more creating the illusion rather than fundamentally hit like trying to control it it's more music in itself is kind of a an illusion really when we listen to it mm -hmm. we always kind of perceive time moving differently but that that in itself is an illusion we're just kind of emotionally connecting to the music so it's kind of that avenue i'm pursuing more rather than thinking i can control time which is a very it's a very noble thing to try and say but it's very yeah it's a very tricky issue <laughs> Well, if I can comment on what Cameron just said, um, I'm in agreement with what you said. Um, going back to what you said at the very beginning today and connecting to what Mary said, um, physical time as measured by the ticking of some kind of a clock and psychological time are two totally different things. And how we experience psychological time, uh, composers putting in perspective and not to take away from anything that the composers like yourselves are doing today, but composers from the middle ages on uh, have created pieces that create a uh, psychological time that is very different the actual measuring how long the piece lasts. I think uh, in the 19th century, Bruckner, uh, not only did he write enormously long symphonies, but uh, within any particular movement, you, you lose track of, uh, of what time you are because of the use of repetitive uh, motifs, etc., etc something that minimalist composers took later in the 20th century. But um, to me, the question of controlling time um, with pardon to your intentions of the composers who want to actually do it, your design is aimed towards creating something 
that the listener will interpret in psychological time. Uh, and if you achieve uh, what the last piece does, a feeling of precipitating into something, uh, is more a question of uh, temporal procedures and instrumental procedures in a question of psychological time, not actual control of the time that you are doing in your piece. So uh, even though I like that uh, uh, accelerando, written accelerando or, or ralentando of going from larger measures to smaller measures, et cetera, et cetera. So you create a descending uh, line there. Uh, but again, I don't believe that uh, you can control physical time with a piece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And um, that's why this is mainly about the control of um, people's experience of time. But then again, that's a whole um, a whole other issue because obviously it's subjective, which is why I find it very interesting to know from the composers what their what their attitude is towards it. So thank you all so very much for um for your contributions um, to this forum. It was, it's really, really interesting. And thanks to everyone for who participated. And it, it was just so interesting to hear from you. The conversations that happen in these um, events are just so interesting and inspiring. So thanks to you for making it so interesting. Um, so also, um, um just a heads up on what's coming up so next month we're going to we're going to have ruben as our guest and to speak to us about the responsibilities um that performers and composers and conductors all have in their combined efforts to create music and um, so we'll hear more about that next month and i'm going to be presenting um, my experience in the same in the same sort of um, uh, residency that Raimonda was in, um, talking about my experience collaborating with professional musicians in, in such a, a way that I, I'd never really experienced before. So um, that that should be interesting. Um, and also, we run a series of drop-in workshops titled Music and Colours. Um, this is a live music and art event where participants create art in connection with an improvisation on the sand tool. So it's exploring that um, connection between vision and mm -hmm. um, concept and music. And the purpose is to find new ways to engage with music and explore our own creative faculties in more depth. So our next workshop will happen at 7 p.m. on Wednesday, the 16th of June at Zahab Academy. Um, if you'd like to know more about this, I'll put it all in the newsletter. Um, also, uh, before we finish, um, we're conducting a um, a survey to try and gather as much information as possible about people's experience, composers and performers' experience during COVID. So the impact that it's had, in order to try and um, basically get support um, and try and keep this going and, and make uh, things better for emerging composers because it's, it's really been a struggle this year. So um, if you'd like to participate in the survey, that would be a huge help to us. Um, I'll post it in the chat now. Um, it, would, it, it would just be very useful to hear from you and your experience as well um yeah um and finally um if you have any feedback uh about your experience this evening please do get in touch um it's always we always find it incredibly valuable and um, our email address is at hotmail at gmail.com if you'll write that in the chat that would be great also um 
really appreciate it if you share this with friends and family so that we can help widen the audience that we reach, give composers greater exposure, because that's what this is all about, really just reaching out and finding new audiences and finding new people to get feedback from um, about different music and engage in new conversations. So thanks again so much for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you next month, which will be, I believe, the 4th of June. So thank you so much. July. July. That's the one. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Back in time. Thank you very much for inviting. Uh, thank you. It was a uh, very interesting. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Good night. Thank Good night. you.